Okay, pause. So I have a couple questions. Uh, one is, what, what wording did you use on that back screen? Because I've read it, and I, I don't think it's from the book. Yeah, great question. It's not from the book. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's actually like not completely a logical phrasing. Okay. Because when you're watching the ballet, we want people to be focused on the dance rather yes. than the words. Yes. The sentences themselves are cohesive and make sense, but there's actually not a story. It's more of an aesthetic choice okay. to give you that sense of writing um, because Orwall in Tilia Faces is writing her book or, or rule. I know is how you That's how I say it. Her, so we'll use that, but O rule as she's going through and kind of writing her case against the gods. We wanted the audience to get that really literal sense of writing, um, but we didn't use words from the book specifically so that you're not reading, but you're just mm -hmm. getting the impression of mm -hmm. writing. Okay, okay. And then I also was curious about the the skirt coming off. I Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's such a, an interesting choice right there. The yeah. Thing. So one of the big kind of thoughts for me in terms of Orul and her character is that she starts out as a little girl um, and she kind of, like all of us, is fresh and new. And, you know, when we're young, I think we have a lot of openness to each other and to God, but when difficult things happen, we tend to build up walls. Right. So throughout the whole show, her dress actually grows from this little tiny dress in the beginning oh. to a much bigger dress by the end. Um, oh. And it's a representation of the walls that Orul is building up throughout the show and how she kind hmm. of slowly pushes everybody away. Um, and I think it really represents the line that Lewis talks about, you know, if you really want to keep your heart safe, don't ever love anyone. Just put mm -hmm. your heart in a little box right. and it'll forever be safe. And right. I'm paraphrasing here, but it'll right. turn into, it'll turn into stone. Right. And so that was one of kind of our key motifs. Uh. Um, so we start out in the big dress because we're starting right there at the end of the show right. where Orwall is, or our rule is making her case against the gods, but then we're bringing you back to the present day. So it's kind of a representation of kind of going from the end of her life and then rewinding back to the beginning. Which is actually how the book starts. Mm -hmm. I mean, the book starts toward the end of her life and she, she says, I'm old now and have not much to fear from the anger of the gods. And she's, she describes herself as a lean carrion who's dressed every day. And so she's, she's old at that point. And, and then she goes back and tells her story. So I liked how you had the book, you were holding the book, she was holding the book up at the beginning um, because yeah. she starts writing the book. Yeah, exactly, you got it. Okay, pause. So something I didn't notice, because this is so complex, like you said, his story is complex, and you had so many things going on. So the complexity of this, oh my goodness, you amazing mind God has given you. So I didn't notice until I watched it again that the ink takes over. Uh, any comments on that? Yeah, um, so I think what we were trying to create through the projections was this sense of Orwell kind of writing, but it's almost gibberish in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. I think, you know, in the book you see that she's writing, and at first her case makes a lot of sense, but right. the more she writes, the less gr ground she has. Uh -huh. She kind of realizes that she doesn't have a leg to stand on. Uh -huh. And so for me, the ink was kind of that representation of she has so many words, but mm -hmm. with all of these words, her point becomes less and less clear. Right. And she says toward the end, you know, the babble that we think we mean mm -hmm. is, is what she, <clears throat> okay, that, that helps.
Okay, pause. So this is just introducing all the characters. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. um, the ballet is told <clears throat> in what I call a plot point form. Okay. So you actually see the story told three times mm -hmm. within the show. And this is the first one. And it's basically bullet points. Um, so yes. It's an outline of her entire life. And yeah, it introduces the characters. And I think with ballet, because it's more difficult a lot of times, oh my goodness. right, to understand. I find the audiences understand it more if they see it a few different times. And so yes. with this, I was mm -hmm. experimenting mm -hmm. with, okay, if we give the plot of the story kind of right up front, you see the entire story in the first five minutes of the right. show. And then we repeat the whole thing again with a lot more depth. Um, but my hope was that this kind of would give the audience a chance to see that and to kind of let it let it resonate before they actually watch the full ballet. And then we repeat the story again at the end of the yes, show. Yes, yes, right. And I also, I thought having Trom, the, the ballet dancer, that was perfect to have that tall guy dance it. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, Jonathan is just phenomenal, and you're right. His frame, he's six foot yes, six, yes. Um, is stunning, you know, and right. really, I think, brought so much, not just of his physical frame, but of his artistic prowess and presence to the role yes. that made him just the perfect That, that really was. <laughs> Okay, pause. So, yeah, I really liked the 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 statue the statue um, representing. I'm assuming Ungat, the goddess. Um, but in the story, initially, she's a stone, a big black stone that's faceless, and it's not till later in the story that the new priest brings in the Aphrodite you know, the shape of a woman. Did you grapple with that at all, or you just decide to go with the woman shape? <laughs> yeah, no, we did. We did really grapple with kind of what the best way was to portray that. Mm -hmm. um, because, again, with ballet, you know, you get um, some stunning visuals, but you don't get as much of an opportunity to explain the visuals. Right. We felt like for people who hadn't read the book, if they were just toting around this giant rock all the time, the people would just really not understand, like, why are they talking to a rock, you know? And I thought people would be so confused. And then, mm -hmm. you know, we'd also kind of told people, hey, this is based on the myth of Cupid and Psyche, which it right. is. And right. Aphrodite is a big part of that story. So I wanted to tell it that way for the folks mm -hmm. coming in with the Greek mythology knowledge who maybe mm -hmm. didn't know Lewis. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, pause. So some, some I heard in some uh, talk back that 
each person or each type of person has certain hand motions mm -hmm. that they repeat. Um, did, did you come up with that or did that come up as you sort of rehearse the ballet? Yeah, great question. So that's actually um, kind of an old trick in some ways that mm. I used in a lot of different ballets. And I think part okay. of it comes from just the fact that hands are so expressive. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. think a lot of us, one of our distinguishing features is how we move our hands mm -hmm. when we're talking, right? right? We all kind of have those those ticks, if you will. Yeah. Um, and so I think as a choreographer over the years, I've developed that into a storytelling device that I think helps. Even if you can't understand what the hands are saying, you can kind of differentiate different people groups and personalities. Yes. How they move their hands. Yes. And you can feel, oh, this is like a very harsh movement you know, versus somebody else who's a bit softer. Mm -hmm. So I think sorting that out for me helps a lot in saying, okay, how would Trom's hands and arms move? Mm -hmm. How would that be different from the Fox, right? Right. Wildly different personalities. Yes. In a way, I, th I think of it as a dialect um, or an accent. Okay, even. that's nice. Yeah. yeah. And so I think that has been a device that's been useful to me to kind of create an aesthetic that differentiates the characters. Mm hmm Okay. Okay, pause. So this is still part of the intro. Yeah, it is. I know. <laughs> okay. We're still, still yes. kind of getting you to present day. So mm -hmm. what you're watching right now is the end of the intro where we go all the way through kind of Orwell's memory. Yes. So in the beginning, we were showing you her case against the gods. Right. We were showing her kind of revealed and peeling back her layers. And right. She starts to realize who she is. Then we're moving you through kind of those lines across the stage, yep. which are her sentences and her writing. And then in this moment, we are rewinding and unwinding her all the way back to being a little girl. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. And in the book, this actually happens in book two. Um, and it's portrayed as her kind of like falling through the floor with Trom. And she's in this kind yes. of fever dream. But yes. I moved that to the beginning of the story uh, okay. because mm -hmm. it wouldn't make as much sense for us to do it at the end. Um, so we kind of took that piece of book two and moved it to the very beginning of the ballet. So that's what's happening right now, and it's bringing her back to being a little girl. Right. Okay. The transition. Exactly. But yeah. 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 Did, you bring, did you have a lot of things from part two that you brought into part one, I mean, so to speak? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Ballet is not very good at kind of moving through time. It's hard to yeah, do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I so I thought one time change was probably all we could handle as an audience. Yes. So the only time we resorted the timeline is this opening sequence. Okay. And then once you see Trom and Orwell, um, which is about to happen, we're actually not going to watch that part. Right, right. When he holds her up to the mirror and she sees yes. herself, that is we are now at present day. Yes. And then we move forward. Uh, Oh, okay. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, it's great. Thank you. <laughs>